Do you think God is less holy in the New Testament than in the Old? Do you think he's less committed to purity or integrity or uprightness? See, we've been so casual with the blood of Jesus. We've been so casual with the Jesus narrative. We've just led, led presumptive, arrogant, prideful, casual lives of faith. Present yourself. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. We don't need a goat or a bull any longer. Jesus offered his blood. What do we have to offer? Just ourselves. Just ourselves. By the time that sacrifice was put on those altars, it had already been slaughtered. It's lifeblood drained out of it. Oftentimes it had already been butchered and portions of it were placed on the altar. It was certainly void of any self-determination. No sacrifice ever jumped off the altar. So when we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, we're saying, God, I'm going to take my self-determination, my will, what I want, what I think, and I'm going to say, I would offer that to you. Now, I don't know about how that, how that works in your life. I can tell you in mine, all that did not happen to me automatically when I made a profession of faith in Jesus. I accepted the Lord when I was a boy. And I'm a few years older and I'm still working on offering that stuff to the Lord. Amen. Amen. And we say, well, it doesn't really matter all that much. You know, the important thing is you said the prayer and you're going to heaven. Folks, I agree that initiation into the kingdom is important, but, but growing up in the Lord matters. <laughs> Romans 6. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. Again, this makes so much more sense in the context of what you're about to read in Leviticus. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you're not under law, but under grace. I've heard verse 14 quoted hundreds and hundreds of times to Christians and from Christians. We're not under law, we're under grace. We're not under law, we're under grace. And we know that grace is the undeserved, unmerited blessing of God. So you can do whatever you want to do because we're not under law, we're under grace. You know by now that a text without a context is a pretext. And you need the context there. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin. That's not a permissive passage. That's not a passage towards sloppy agape. That's a passage reminding us that you cannot offer yourself to ungodliness and think you are in good standing with the Lord. If you could, we wouldn't need the sacrifices. And we looked in a previous session, if you have... If you choose to practice sin, there is no longer any sacrifice for you. We may sin, but we're, the, the category is to do it unintentionally, not purposefully. Do not build a plan for ungodliness and imagine there's an easy solution for you. That's the scripture. You see, if we offer the parts of our body to sin, to use the biblical phrase, we nullify the grace of God. The Bible tells us, it warns us not to receive the grace of God in vain, in futility. How could you nullify? What could you do to make the grace of God, his unearned favor, not useful for you? You could choose to offer yourself the parts of your body to sin. Don't do that. Offerings presented to God. Folks, it's not a cumbersome book. It's a very important reminder of the nature of this relationship we're trying to fashion. Let's push on. Chapter 10, the very next chapter, Aaron is the priest, the high priest, and his sons, a part of the priestly family, have been recruited to help serve in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. And they decide to go off script well, they've been trained, they've been coached, they've been shown the pattern, but they decide they're going to introduce a little personal creativity. And Nadab and Abihu, 
the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, they placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord. Now we don't have any more definition than those words, strange fire. Strange being unusual, not the pattern, beyond what they had been instructed with. Just a little personal self-expression, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, it's what the Lord spoke saying by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron kept silent. There's some things we can learn about the presence of the Lord, what it means. In Leviticus, it says they came before the Lord. I can tell you to come before the Lord is not a casual place. It's not a casual place. You know, dress code in church has been something that's been debated as long as I've been a part of church. When I was a little boy, you went to church like you were going to a formal. Our whole culture has become more casual. I don't really have any problem with that. I've escaped a tie. Hallelujah. <laughs> it works for me. The argument was that our clothing at church was about pride and arrogance, and we would present in clothes that were finer than other people could afford. I'm sure that happened. It's human nature and human character. I still believe we should present ourselves to the Lord in a way that reflects an almighty God. I don't, I'm not arguing that it requires formal wear, but I, do, I would submit to you that if you give more attention to how you present yourself when you're going out for an evening out than you do for a place of worship, you need to think about your priorities. Again, I'm not arguing for more formal clothing. But coming before the Lord is not a casual place, nor is it a selfish place. It's not a place for selfish indulgence. And again, we have, we've lost this. Again, to me, the, the opportunity in the book of Leviticus is to recognize the place we are in the unfolding purposes of God. We need a church that is more empowered, more bold, more anointed, more aware, more understanding of the nature of God's kingdom than at any time in our lifetime. Or our children and our grandchildren are going to suffer the consequences. So it has me reading my Bible saying, God, where have I lived presumptively and arrogantly? Where have I been ambivalent, indifferent? When I could have brought a bit more focused attention. And when I got the book of Leviticus open again, I thought, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've let church become a selfish thing in so many ways. It's not the, the time I like to worship or it's not the style of music in which I like to worship or it wasn't the song that I wanted to sing or I don't like where I had to park or we're like Goldilocks. It's too small, too big, too hot, too cold. And we're all looking for just right. And usually just right has little to do with us. It's about all the people around us who smiled at us. Do you see what God said in those last verses? I will be treated as holy. I will be treated as holy. And I will be honored. Now, I think the only way of understanding this particular passage is an example of exemplary judgment. It's not that God strikes dead every person that is sloppy in expressions of worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But God is establishing something for this group of people. They're just a few days out of the slave pits of Egypt. And they've begun their lessons on what it means to come into the presence of a holy God. And there's a group of people that have been identified to serve as priests. And they're learning the patterns and the habits so that the rest of the people can understand that. And God makes an example of these two young men that treat that casually. So we call it a judgment that is an example of God, you see, when God's judgment is delayed, we shouldn't imagine that it's going to be justice denied. God in his mercy and grace does not always immediately visit his judgment upon us. But God in his grace and mercy in scripture has shown us very clear patterns of what his justice will look like. This is not just an Old Testament concept. 
We won't turn there, but in the book of Acts in chapter 5, it's very similar in the sense that the church is a very new thing. Jesus ascended back to heaven in Acts chapter 1, and they're just trying to get their legs under them and understand what it means to be the Jesus people in Jesus' absence. And the church is beginning to gain some momentum, and they're bringing their offerings to the apostles, and Ananias and Sapphira come with theirs, and they misrepresent them. They say they're bringing the full purchase price of a piece of property and sacrificially giving it all, when in reality they've kept part of it back. And they're struck dead individually over the course of a day. And in both cases, the message is the same. It was your money. You could have done whatever you wanted to with it. You could have kept it. You could have given it. You could have done whatever. But you've chosen to lie about the Holy Spirit. It's an example. Everybody that misrepresents their gift is struck dead. Hallelujah. It's another example of that kind of an exemplary judgment from God. But it's reminding us that God is holy. He said, I will be treated as holy. The New Testament tells us that no one will see the Lord without holiness. See, we've completely just tossed it out the window and go, oh, no, no, I said the prayer. Well, again, I believe in conversion, but you can't throw the rest of the narrative out. I like Psalm 24 a lot. It asks a question that's relevant in every generation. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Folks, we better know how to answer those questions. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord and who can stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who doesn't lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. That's a sobering collection of statements in a season where the truth is treated with contempt. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. I think Leviticus introduces us to another idea regarding these offerings. And it's an idea that's being challenged in contemporary culture, even within contemporary church culture. And it has to do with this notion of divine authority. There is a God. And it's not us. And the, the, the privilege and the opportunity of Scripture is to understand God's principles, His character, His nature, His directions. You may not like them, but the invitation is that if you will submit to them, you can live, both in time and for all eternity. If you rebel against them, you can make that choice. God will honor your choice. But there's a consequence for that. In Leviticus 11 and verse 1, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Say to the Israelites, Of all the animals that live on land, these are the ones you may eat. And then it starts into this rather lengthy list of animals who have a, a hoof that is split or not, or fish that have scales or don't. And you think it's a little cumbersome, but I think the, the premise of it is not cumbersome at all. It's sobering. That God is the one that establishes the boundaries for holy or unholy, clean or unclean, righteous or unrighteous. We don't do that. It's not about conventional wisdom or changing fads or social customs. Folks, we've got to come back to the values of Scripture. If we want to continue to see our liberties and freedoms extended, they come from God, not from governments. And the church has lost sight of that. We've imagined that the systems under which we lived were so stable, so unassailable, that our faith wasn't that important. And God has begun a shaking. And the outcome isn't clear yet because I don't believe we've made our decisions yet. Look in Galatians 5 and verse 19. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. And then there's more than a dozen listed. And they're things we're all familiar with. Not as observers of other people. We're familiar with them from the inside out. Amen, Pastor. The good news is most of us aren't tempted on all of those points, but there's something in that list that is a temptation to all of us. It's the last sentence I would call your attention to. Those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot practice those things and inherit the kingdom of God. 
No matter where you sit on the weekend, no matter how kind or generous or loving, it's a scriptural principle. It didn't begin in the New Testament. It's the story of God's character that we're introduced to in the opening books of our Bible. God has revealed the boundaries of his kingdom. He has revealed to us that he is sovereign over all of creation. He made the earth and everything that's in it. And he will ultimately hold it accountable to his righteous standards. And we can choose to cooperate with that and reap the benefits for all eternity. Or we can stand in opposition to that. So when we talk about being salt and light in our world and in our culture, it's not just to do evangelism and lead people in a prayer. It's to be advocates for a biblical worldview in every sphere of influence with which we have been entrusted. And I would submit to you humbly that we have abandoned that notion. We've just said it's not our problem. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. People won't like it. They're, they're going to label us or call us names or cancel us. Or we'll be censored or somebody say we're out of date or our names will be taken off an, an invitation list. All the, those above things could happen. If God is pleased, I would submit to you it's worth it. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content and we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.